اغمض عينيك وتذكى اغمض عينيك وتذكر تسبيحا حلوا بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Before we begin I just want to mention and I'll extend my gratitude to Al Hidayah Masjid as well as Nobody Muslim Center in this collaboration I hope this is going to be one of many more to come بإذن الله and it's a beautiful thing to see us coming together for خير as Allah سبحانه وتعالى says in the Quran وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى له so come together and, and, and join together in, in goodness and in piety. Uh, the second thing I'd like to mention is that we're presenting this or we're hosting this as the Muslim World Media Group, which I'm the editor of. My name's Ahmed Jeddah. Uh, and just as a short introduction as to what we do, our, our, um, our aim is to provide easy and accessible ways to enrich our understanding of the Muslim world, whether it's politics or economics or cultural or historical aspects, we provide it in an easy, accessible manner through our social media platforms. But our main platform at the moment is the Telegram group, which you can see uh, on this, this display here. So if you'd like to join, you can join using the TMW underscore media to uh, keep updated with what's going on in the Muslim world. And also in relation to questions tonight, if you have any, you can go onto that group and you can post it onto the comments section for the advertisement for this event, Allah. So to proceed, we are in day 21 of a genocide. A genocide that has been inflicted upon the people of Gaza by an Israeli regime that has really transgressed all bounds. And in these 21 days, we have been witness to the most atrocious, the most barbarous and the most depraved acts of violence against the defenseless people. So far, I believe the estimates are around 7,500 people have been killed. More than half, perhaps, or around half have been children. And yet we're being told, at least, that it's Israel defending themselves, that this is self-defense. They were provoked. That is that the militarily occupying force is defending itself against those that they are occupying. And those that claim leadership of the liberal world order, those that celebrate a rules-based system of international humanitarian law, they celebrate the fact that they are the vanguards of human rights and international criminal courts and such, they are the same people that have given Israel the cover the diplomatic and material cover for them to continue committing these blatant crimes against humanity. The mask, it seems, has well and truly come off. So with complete impunity, Israel has proceeded to flatten, to demolish, to destroy homes, apartment buildings, hospitals, bakeries, schools, water facilities, but there's one thing that they haven't destroyed and demolished and one thing they will never be able to destroy or demolish and that is the spirit of resistance that lays deep in the heart of every Palestinian. The one thing they will never demolish is the iman, the light that emanates from the hearts of the Palestinian people. And for that reason, that reason alone, Israel's plots and their machinations, they will never be successful and ultimately the Palestinian people, sooner or later, bi'ithnillah, they will be successful and they will be victorious, bi'ithnillah. However, this really does feel like a significant moment in history that we're experiencing at this moment. Like a change is at foot. Like the world will never quite be the same after October the 7th, 2023. So to make sense of it all, once again, we're delighted and honored to have back with us Samuel Hamadi, who is the managing director of International Interest, which is a political risk company that focuses on the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, Sammy contributes to many podcasts and broadcasts as well. And he is fast becoming a very important and prominent and articulate voice of our community. So we're very happy to have him with us here today. And Sammy, I was going to begin by talking about the situation as things stand in Gaza, 
because 21 days in and there has been no ground incursion yet. There's been massive aerial bombardment of, of the small 25 mile long, five mile wide strip. But as of yet, no ground incursion. And the questions and the discussions were as to why it hasn't happened yet. Because initially, when the, big, the conflict began, it was said that perhaps it would take 10 to 15 days for them to be ready. Yeah, it's day 21. However, over the last hour, news has come through that all telecommunications have been shut off in Gaza, that they have been cut off from the outside world. And it seems as though, and I'm just getting the news as it comes in, and maybe Sammy can uh, fill us in with a little bit more, but it seems as though there has been a ground incursion. There have been uh, limited ground incursions over the last couple of days or so, but it seems to me that this is something more serious. The question is, why now? Is it defiance? against a UN General Assembly? Is it because Israel knows that the brutality that they've been meeting out on the Gaza Strip is starting to soften the tone of even America towards the situation and they're worried that it could be that they're approaching something of the pressure to, to, uh, towards a ceasefire? Uh, or is it just that they are planning the next phase of this operation? What do you think and what are your thoughts about the situation as things stand? Um, salam alaikum, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, a caveat: my day job is cold political analysis, so some of what I say may sound harsh on the ear, but it is the reality of what's unfolding. And today we'll try to discuss the considerations of what's called Israel, between quotation marks, uh, Palestinians, Hamas, and some of the regional powers as well. I, it took me one hour, 50 minutes to get here. When I left the office, there was no news of an impending ground invasion. Once I got onto the train at Victoria, the news started coming in that all internet was cut off from Gaza. The Israelis have started firing flashlights into the sky, the ones that when they explode, it provides light for, to see. And there is an attack now on the northeastern part of Gaza. There's a column of Israeli tanks. The suggestion is that they're going to go in. Last night, there was a raid by Israeli forces. The Hamas claimed that they captured one of the Israeli forces that tried to raid into. It was believed to be a raid in order to test the defenses of Hamas. One of the reasons that it's taken so long to actually start a ground invasion, and it's worth noting here that Israeli channels are now calling it a ground invasion. I know, forgive me, the brothers who were talking, I was just looking on the phone at the time. I've just seen five minutes ago, Israeli channels are saying that a ground offensive has begun on Gaza. And we'll try to put some of that into context. So earlier today, the leaks from Qatar were that we were close to an, to an agreement on a ceasefire and an exchange of prisoners. So the mood was that this was going to start winding down soon and that there would be no need for a ground invasion. Axios, the in Israeli intelligence magazine, reports that the failure of the negotiations is the reason why they've announced a ground invasion. But I think it's much bigger than that. And I think that it's easier understood if we imagine we are Netanyahu. Imagine that we are Benny Gantz and we're sitting in the Israeli war room. The Palestinians, three weeks ago before October 7th, Netanyahu was standing at the United Nations with a map of his vision of the Middle East and he had wiped out Palestine completely from that map. In the same breath, he said that we are on the verge of normalization of ties with Saudi Arabia, which will be the greatest deal, quote, since the end of the Cold War. The Israeli ambassador to the UN then told Cannes Television, Israeli television, that normalization with Saudi Arabia will mean the complete Arab abandonment of the Palestinians, and this is something that the government will celebrate, and therefore they will not hold on any normalization. Netanyahu then managed to get a picture with Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the Turkish president, the first time that they've met since Erdogan actually came to power, and that picture was promoted on the Israelis as saying that Erdogan is now coming for warmer ties, for closer ties. Erdogan wants a gas pipeline. He wants an economic corridor. He believes that given the economic crisis in Turkey or Turkey, he believes that now is the time to for warmer ties with Israel in order to develop those economic circumstances. In this context, when Netanyahu returned to Tel Aviv after the United Nations, and you'll see why this relates to the ground offensive, Netanyahu was convinced that the Palestinian cause was dying. And even King Abdullah of Jordan was coming out with statements in a panic saying, you cannot normalize ties and fly over the heads of the Palestinians and expect that nothing will happen. It's at this point that Netanyahu meets the greatest threat to Israel since 1948. 
The Palestinians launch an attack on October 7th, the first time they ever take back territory from the Israelis, even if they only held it for a temporary time. It's the first time that the Palestinians even temporarily took back territory that the Israelis had taken. And it took more than 24 hours for the Israeli army even to arrive to some of those settlement areas where Hamas or the Palestinian, other nine Palestinian factions had taken that territory. It shocked Netanyahu so badly that the Palestinians had launched this body blow and they were supposed to be weak, that he declared war and Israel now has declared war for the first time since 1973. The reason why I mention all that is because it's important to understand how Netanyahu is feeling. In that the Palestinians who are supposed to be savages and animals from his perspective and supposed to be dying and weak should never have been able to mount this attack. The reaction of the ordinary Israeli population, according to the polls, was that this was Netanyahu's fault. That Netanyahu lulled us into a false sense of security, that on his watch Israel is meeting the greatest threat that it's faced since 1948. It's all his fault. We need to get Netanyahu to resign and we need a new government. So instead of Israelis calling for revenge and a ground invasion, Netanyahu instead found that 80% of Israelis, according to the polls, were asking for his resignation. Not only that rumors were emerging that the Americans were discussing with Benny Gantz, the former defense minister, that they would replace Netanyahu with Benny Gantz, that they would rally around him and maybe Benny Gantz would be able to take Netanyahu's position and maybe the government would be able to fall. And that's why Netanyahu, it took him more than a week to even be able to form a war cabinet. You would expect that in a situation such as that, all the parties would rally to Netanyahu and they would form a war cabinet, a united front. But instead... The parties in Israel believe that it was Netanyahu's fault and we shouldn't rescue Netanyahu by entering into a war cabinet. Instead, we should pressure him to resign and then form our own government and then deal with the attack of whatever Hamas has done or whatever the other Palestinian factions have done. The reason that's significant is because it explains why the Times of Israel two days ago reported that when Hamas released the two, refugee, the two hostages, the two elderly Israeli women, Israel, uh, the Times of Israel reported that Netanyahu was upset, that he was angry that the hostages had been released. The commanders of the IDF were upset that the hostages were being released. Not only were they upset that the hostages being released, they were upset at the video of the hostages being released, where I don't know if you've seen it, the woman she walks turns back to go and shake the hands of her captors and tells them Shalom Alaikum. When the hostage later gave her statement on how she'd been treated, they were stunned to find that she said, we ate the same food they ate, they treated us very well, and when she was asked by the Israeli journalist, why did you turn back and shake the hand, to show that we are not exaggerating when we thought that was significant, the Israeli journalist asked, why did you turn back to shake the hand of these savages, monsters, these animals and whatever? And she says, why wouldn't I shake their hands? They treated me so well. So Netanyahu, imagine his position now. Hostages are being released, which means that your reason for war is weaker than it was before. Israelis are demanding your resignation, meaning if the war ends, you will have to face your people, and your people at this moment in time will not say, I was going to say mashallah, but they wouldn't say mashallah, but they would say, well done Netanyahu. Instead they would say, Netanyahu, we want you out. Even the hostages' families, Netanyahu has not attended a single funeral for any of the hostages that were taken. The reason being is Netanyahu fears that when he goes, the, host the families of hostages will turn on him. The point I'm making here is we are talking about this as Israel versus the Palestinians, when in reality, at, as it stands at this moment, it's Netanyahu versus the Palestinians. Not the Israelis. The Israelis are overwhelming now against Netanyahu. The Israelis at this moment in time are so shell-shocked by what happened that they're looking for a de-escalation quickly. The families of the hostages cannot understand why Netanyahu is upset that the hostages are being released and also that Netanyahu is carpet-bombing Gaza knowing full well that he's killing hostages in the, in the process but doesn't seem to show any sympathy or any affection for these hostages that are in Palestine or in Gaza. So the point here that I'm making is that, and this is what I meant by it might, sound cold, it might sound harsh on the ears. This is not Israel versus Palestine now with this ground offensive. This is Netanyahu panicking that we were on the verge of a ceasefire only a few hours ago. 
that the Americans and the Qataris had sat together and come to some sort of initial agreement for a hostage exchange and a ceasefire. And Netanyahu panicked because a ceasefire means the end of his political career. Not only the end of his political career, but he would go down, think about it, imagine you're Israeli. He would go down in history as the worst prime minister ever to enter office in Israel. And that's why we've seen suddenly that yesterday when it appeared that no ground invasion was imminent, that it was all posturing, today we see that Netanyahu is scrambling for a ground invasion when negotiations have faltered. The reason I mention all of this is because it looks like on the ground invasion, and to be honest, brothers, I, I'm, I'm doing my best here to keep the emotions aside, but I tell you my stomach feels upside down and there's a huge knot in it at this moment in time. I'm walking down, I think Yusuf asked to pick me up from the station, I told him, don't, not yet. I need the 15 minute walk just to calm down a little bit. Because the news is horrible, the, the views that you're seeing from Gaza is horrible. They've turned out all the lies, all the internet. It is the worst bombing ever. And Wa'il Dahdouh, the Al Jazeera journalist, says this is the worst that he's ever seen in his career in terms of his war correspondence. He's using the words genocide and holocaust unfolding before our eyes. We're seeing here now, even in the UK, Hamza Youssef in, 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 in Scotland, we're seeing Jeremy Corbyn, others scrambling, panicking. Even Sadiq Khan can no longer remain quiet. Even he can no longer remain quiet. They're all coming out desperately scrambling, calling for the ceasefire because they know what is about to unfold in Gaza. But what the point that I want to make here is, this is not Israel going into Gaza. This is Netanyahu who was so terrified about the prospect of a ceasefire, so terrified about his political future, that he believes now genocide is the only way in which he can continue to stay in power or at least delay facing the Israeli people who according to the polls are demanding his resignation. The reason I highlight this particular point is to stress your role in it. One of the reasons that Netanyahu has not been able to win over the Israelis despite spending millions of pounds in YouTube ads that even popped up on the last talk that we did when you go into the one that, in the last in El Muzammil, if before you open the video for the talk that we did, you see in pro IDF advert, which shows the money that they've spent. And if you anyone who's done YouTube ads, you can see the categories that you click. They've probably clicked Islam and they've clicked Muslim to, to really push that. My wife runs a travel company, a tour company. She received an email from a PR company saying that Israel is under attack from a terrorist attack. We're willing to offer you money if you can help to send this letter out to your subscribers and to your people. It shows you the extent that they went. The way they made up fake news about 40 beheaded babies after Al Jazeera made viral the clip of uh, the Palestinian soldiers with the Jewish woman telling her, Usturuha, Usturuha, cover her, cover her, make her feel safe. Or when Channel 12, the Israeli channel, reported the woman and she said, when they entered my home, I thought they were going to kill me and massacre me. Instead, he said to me, I'm Muslim, I won't harm you. What else did they do? They walked around for two hours and then he asked me for a banana and then he left. Israel has been panicking that on Israeli radio, one of the survivors in one of their, they call it a kibbutz, the, the settlements, on live radio she said that when the IDF came, I saw them shooting the Israelis, shooting our own people. And it was cut in the version that was put up and the, the presenter cuts her off immediately. Which is why Israel has been, in the words of Dr. Asim Qureshi, the Israelis have been telling the world what's happening without showing anything, while the Palestinians have been showing the world what's happening, which is why everybody's believing them and not believing the Israelis and the IDF. The point here being, if you consider that Netanyahu in his position, after suffering the greatest humiliation since 1948, scrambles to try to change the narrative, to tell the world that this is a, 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 a light versus darkness, and he spends all that money, millions of pounds, on it, and still Israeli public opinion wants him to resign. The YouGov poll here in the UK, 76% in favor of a ceasefire, unprecedented. In the United States, more than 60% in the latest Gallup poll are in favor of immediate ceasefire, that's unprecedented. All that money being spent, and all you guys did was share and comment and retweet. And that managed to bring down the whole of that campaign. And the people now who will pay the price for Netanyahu's ego and for Netanyahu's political future are the Palestinian children, the Palestinian mothers, Palestinian elderly. Netanyahu believes that he needs to increase that death toll because to stand down in a ceasefire means the end of his political future. And that's also one of the reasons, and I'll finish on this point before handing over the next question, it's also one of the reasons why the other Muslim nations are so insistent on diplomatic efforts, because they're telling the Americans behind the scenes, America, Israel has already achieved all its strategic objectives. This is all about Netanyahu now, get him to rein in, get him to stop. 
And privately, Biden is telling Netanyahu, what's your strategy here? You need to give me a timeline. While in public saying that our support is unwavering. But I think that having said all of that, this hour as we're speaking, the darkest chapter is unfolding for Gaza. And we ask Allah to be in their support, inshallah. Just to build on the points that you were making there, Netanyahu's stated aim at the beginning of this was one, to wipe out Hamas off the face of this earth. And the second thing was to bring back their hostages. Both of these aims seem untenable, particularly wiping out Hamas. And they themselves, the Israelis, I'm sure, know this. The question presents itself in relation to what everything that you've just said, in relation to the fact that Netanyahu seems to have gone rogue in what he's doing on the Gaza Strip. What is the end game for Netanyahu? What is it that he seeks to achieve so much so that he will save face and then call it a day? Or is it the fact that he will continue to rain down terror upon the people of Gaza until the Americans will themselves have to rein him in? So how does this play out and how does this end? Netanyahu believes in an Israel that wipes Palestine out completely and that expands into some of the other Arab countries as well. For Netanyahu, he believes that the only way out in which he stays in power is to annex Gaza. One of the issues that he's had with regards to his ground invasion is what do you do with the Palestinians who are in Gaza? Which is why Sisi has been under immense pressure to open that Rafah crossing border to let the Palestinians cross over and enter the Sinai Peninsula. And it's why Biden yesterday actually said in his statement in the White House that Congress must prepare urgent financial aid to the neighboring countries to receive the Palestinians who will be fleeing Gaza. The aim for, uh, for Netanyahu is to empty Gaza of the Palestinians, to do another Nakba, to say to the Israelis, yes, they mounted the greatest threat since 1948, but I managed to take Gaza and I'm going to hand that over to Israeli settlers and I'm going to build alongside with Saudi Arabia and the UAE a version of our own version of Vision 2030. We will build hotels and resorts in Gaza and we will show what Gaza will look like under our own administration. And the Palestinians can go to Egypt and Sisi can take money from the US and he will be able to finance the Gazans and the Palestinians over there. And that will be the, the gift that Netanyahu gives to the Israelis in order for Israelis to be happy with him. The issue that Netanyahu has been facing, however, Sisi does not want the Palestinians to enter the Sinai Peninsula. And the Egyptian foreign minister actually told Financial Times in a leaked uh, recording that if the Palestinians enter the Sinai Peninsula, we will put them on boats and send them straight to Europe. Let Europe deal with them with the human rights situation. I don't know how nice that sounds for a Muslim brother to talk about other Muslims like that, but that's besides the point. The point here is Sisi was so under pressure that he even for the first time allowed protests to take place in Egypt. You'll know that Sisi, since toppling Mohammed Morsi, Allah Yarahmu, or toppling the democratic transition, hasn't allowed protests to take place in Egypt. Sisi spent ages considering whether he should allow protests or not, because he feared that if people come out on the streets, and they will in their thousands to support Palestine, they might suddenly say, wait a minute, we're in the streets, let's go after Sisi and topple him, and finally take our rights and take our process, take our, the governance back. And some people tried to do that. They tried to go to Medina Tahrir, they tried to go to Tahrir Square, but they were met with very violent police brutality and the like. But the point is Sisi allowed protests to take place because he wanted to suggest to the Americans that I have popular support. Because the reason the Americans and Israelis believe that Sisi will do their bidding is because the Americans say that Sisi really have no choice. The people don't like you. You don't have the power to be able to resist us. Take the money and let the Palestinians go into... And that's why the Israelis bombed Rafah crossing to humiliate the Egyptian army. And it's one of the reasons why they also sent a missile near the Red Sea to humiliate the Egyptian army, to chip away at this image of the Egyptian army as being strong so that the Egyptians will say, okay, fine, open the Rafah crossing and we will find some way as a PR exercise to say this is rescuing the Gazans. The reason Sisi doesn't want the Palestinians into the Sinai Peninsula, in my opinion, is because if he does, he will go down in history as a villain who contributed to the Nakba and contributed to the displacement of the Palestinians. And that's why for many people who say the Rafah crossing should be opened, it's true that it should be opened. I like to think that if we were in Sisi's position, we'd open it. But it's also important to be aware that once that crossing opens completely and the Palestinians from Gaza enter Egypt, no one here can honestly say that Israel will let them back in. It will be a Nakba and Israel will annex Gaza and they will take it and then we will enter essentially another defeat for the Palestinians and the like. That's why Netanyahu is frustrated that the Palestinians are staying there and it's why the Palestinians have taught us a lesson in courage. 
when you see those videos and they say, I'm not leaving, wallahi, I'm not leaving. It's either here or shahada, they say. We saw them in the hospitals as well telling each other, shahada is us soon, inshallah, shahada is us soon, inshallah. Well, Dahduh, you saw him. They targeted his wife and his two children. They killed them and slaughtered them. Miskeen is leaving the hospital in tears. Next morning, he's in front of the camera telling me, I know they wanted me to stop the attack because they wanted to stop my voice from telling the people what's happening in Gaza. Ibadallah, Israel is absolutely furious that they've lost control over the narrative and public opinion. They're furious, they're livid. And it's because the Palestinians have shown us what's been happening in Gaza. That's why they cut off the internet to make sure they can't show us. Because they're furious. How can these Gazans who were supposed to bombard and destroy communicate with the Ummah at large who have amplified their voice, who have now convinced Jewish people to sit in in Congress, to block Congress, to block the White House, who have convinced protests to take to the streets in Paris when Macron has banned them, convinced people to take to the streets in Rome, in Berlin, in New York, in Chicago, in Washington, in all these places. Why are they changing public opinion? And you'll note that the former Israeli intelligence chief to Sky News three days ago, he remarks, bewildered, baffled, he goes, I don't understand, why does the world care about these savages? He's stunned that the public opinion has changed. And the reason why I mention that is because it goes back to this point in that the issue now, for in terms of this grand evasion, what's Netanyahu's end game? Netanyahu believes the only way he comes out of this in power is to annex Gaza. To annex Gaza, he needs to empty it of the Palestinians. He does that in one of two ways, genocide or ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing means to put them in the Sinai Peninsula, genocide means to kill them. Which is why Biden and John Kirby have tried to help him with cover by doubting the figures of the Palestinian Health Ministry, which is recognized by human rights as very accurate, but they've tried to cast doubt on it so that when the Palestinians say that thousands have been killed, it gives room for BBC and CNN to turn around and say, but Biden and the White House said that these numbers have to be put in doubt as well. And that's why, and before I hand over for the next question, that's why your duty here is more important than ever, brothers. The reason why they can't deny what's happening in Gaza is because you're amplifying the voice. You're, you are the ones who are sending it. When the BBC presenter apologized for spreading the news about the beheaded babies or calling the protests uh, terrorist uh, and the like, the reason she apologized was not because Israel asked her to. Israel was more than happy with the coverage. It wasn't because the White House sent a protest or Keir Starmer sent a protest. It was because the feedback that they got, and I've worked in the media industry, the feedback that they got, the overwhelming feedback from you, the anger that they felt from you, meant that the presenter felt we need to fend off this backlash and we need to apologize. The CNN presenter was the same way. It's up to you guys to push back against Biden as well. It was public pressure on social media, and I promise you, it was social media, that meant that when Biden came out and said, I've seen pictures of beheaded babies, the White House came out within 24 hours and said Biden didn't see the pictures. It was Netanyahu who told us that there were beheaded babies or the like. Netanyahu wants to empty Gaza, but what Netanyahu is concerned about is once he goes into Gaza, Hezbollah and the Iranian proxies will attack from behind. Remember that this Israeli army is not the Israeli army of 1973 that fought against Egypt or fought against Syria. This is an army whose only real combat experience is in policing. It's in breaking the bones of little kids. It's in beating up the elderly. It's in shooting unarmed teenagers. It's not in real battle, real ground offensive or the like. Which is why they're concerned that any ground offensive will be like the previous ground offensives that have failed. Point here being is that a ground offensive is not an easy feat. It's not easy a ground offensive for the Israeli army, which is why they've been hesitant. Which is why also, and I'll finish on this particular point. I'm notorious for that statement, but please bear with me. Which is why it's unclear as of now if this is a full-on ground offensive or if this is a skirmish that is taking place if this is a testing of the defense or to raise the stakes at the negotiating table or whether this is actually a ground offensive. It's not clear yet. We're talking based on the information we're receiving, but it's real-time information. So you're trying to digest it. But the general trend is clear. The question, what does Netanyahu want? Empty Gaza of the Palestinians, send them off to Egypt, annex Gaza, and build a new vision 2030 and hand it over to the Israeli settlers. 2.3 million people in the Gaza Strip. 2.3 million people, approximately. Uh, if what you say is correct, that this is the stated aim of Netanyahu, it seems that he would have to go about quite an operation to uh, actualize that ambition. Do you, act, do you think, well, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask in relation to this. The first one is, even 
regarding the American support that seems ironclad at all times. Is it even possible that he would be able to achieve that, considering the backlash, considering the outrage across the world, considering the fact that even the Americans are changing their rhetoric in relation to this? Is this even possible for him to achieve? That's the first thing. The second thing, and I'd like you to join this on to the point that I'm making here, which is you did mention and quite correctly that the narrative has changed and because of social media, the Israeli lies and the Israeli propaganda is no longer effective and people have seen the reality of what's going on. That has had a change and we've seen it in real time, but furthermore, what material change does that have in terms of the gains, the political gains that the Palestinians will make in the long term? Of course it has an impact in relation to the conflict that's happening now, but what can that actually bring the Palestinians in relation to their aspiration for freedom and self-determination? In terms of the first question with regards to there are two million people in Gaza that are like, I think even Netanyahu himself is unsure how this will look like or how he's going to displace those two million Gazans or, or what exactly the ground offensive will look like. And it was very interesting that when Biden went to Tel Aviv, the reports that got leaked was that apparently Biden and Netanyahu had argued because Biden wanted a clear strategy presented to him and Netanyahu could not present him with a clear strategy in terms of what he actually wanted to achieve in Gaza. Reinforcing the point that a lot of this is about Netanyahu, Netanyahu's politicking, Netanyahu trying to stay in power, as opposed to the generals actually having a plan in terms of what to do. It's also the reason why Biden sent a three-star general to the Israelis to try to advise them about a the ground offensive while simultaneously saying in the White House itself that we've told the Israelis that a ground offensive with no clear strategic aims is some, that the, they should not consider a ground offensive unless they have strategic aims. Suggesting that for Biden, he's, even the Americans are not sure what strategic aims can be viably achieved with a ground offensive. That's important to highlight here, and it's important to highlight here as well. There is this perception that Israel is an almighty army that's going to flatten Gaza and walk all over it. Israelis have tried twice, twice before to launch a ground offensive in Gaza. They failed twice. It's not an easy process to go into Gaza or the like. And the reason why I say this is that if with the, in terms of the process for Netanyahu, Netanyahu himself doesn't know the process through which he's going to em empty Gaza and doesn't know how he's been bombing them, bombing them in the south, bombing them in the north, hoping that they'll flee. They haven't fled. He bombed the hospital. He's been bombing mosques. He's been bombing churches. He's been flattening everything. And still the Gazans won't leave. It's a two million population. He's killed about 5,000 of them, which means there are still two million, however many numbers there are. To put it into context, in terms of how many Palestinians are still there. Also, the fact that hostages were released and that negotiations are ongoing through the Qataris suggests that at least the topic of ceasefire, if it's not discussed publicly, is being discussed privately. The third point is you'll note that Blinken, who wouldn't even mention the word ceasefire since 7th of October, two days ago finally talked about a pause in the fighting, a pause for a humanitarian pause. And that's come about after Blinken and the State Department has been under pressure from those who work inside, you'll notice the resignation of one of the senior directors from the State Department, John Paul. You'll also note that the Blinken had to hold a listening session with very angry staff members at the State Department. Even if this hasn't resulted in a material change, the fact that he has to address this shows that the voices are getting louder and the pressure is getting louder. The reason why I mention all of this is that it looks like there's a concerted effort to ethnically cleanse Gaza. But the reality suggests it's a very difficult process. It's not easy. This ummah is very difficult to kill. The Muslim world was colonized for more than 150 years, 200 years. The Muslims still took their independence back. We entered an era of authoritarian regimes and, and brutal authoritarian regimes. The Arab Spring showed that the ummah can take down these invincible regimes when the moment comes. This ummah is not easy to defeat. It's not easy to beat. I never see this kind of attacks on Hinduism. I never see these kind of attacks on Buddhism. I never see these kind of attacks on any other religion except Islam. Because no matter how much it's attacked, Muslims just seem to grow and grow and grow. You look at the list of the 500 most influential Muslims this year round. Paul Williams is there. Somebody who entered Islam, mashallah, embraced it so wholeheartedly. He's teaching us the deen, mashallah. And he is the one giving da'wah, mashallah. You look at, for example, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Al Murad in Cambridge, in, in, in Cambridge, in the Cambridge Mosque, a revert to Islam. Allah guided his heart and made him a source through which everybody is gaining knowledge. Mashallah. 
No matter what happens, no matter how much they batter the ummah, the ummah just seems to grow. More and more people seem to enter Islam. That's something that is concerning for those who are in the US, the ideologues like Lindsey Graham who says this is a religious war. We Muslims believe that it's not a religious war as much as it's a war of justice. That we are trying to restore the justice of the Palestinians in terms of who were driven out of their homes and driven off after their land. It's not a war for revenge. We are Muslims, we don't let ta'tadu, we don't go beyond that. We are Muslims who take what's ours and then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu gave us the example. Once the rights are restored when he entered Mecca, he embraced everybody. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed this deen with, other, with those who entered after Fath Mecca. Suhail ibn Amr, you'll remember the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, he mocked the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa When they went to write the treaty, and the Ali ibn Abi Tar anhu writes, Muhammad Rasulullah, Suhail ibn Amr says to him, Ya Muhammad, if we thought you were Rasulullah, ma harabnak, we would never have fought a war. Remove this uh, silly sentence. And Ali ibn Abi Talib gets angry and the Prophet doesn't remove it. Write Muhammad ibn Abdullah. After the Prophet died and the people of Quraysh, some of them thought about turning their back on the deen, it was Suhail ibn Amr who stood next to the Kaaba and said, Ya Quraysh, we were the last to enter this deen. Will you have the people laugh at us and say we were the first to leave it? And Quraysh decided to stay upon the deen. They decided to stay upon the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala flips the hearts. That's when the Muslims, why when the Muslims talk about Palestinians, brothers, beware how you talk about this issue. This is not a war on the Jews. This is a war on those who, dis, who, who dishonestly and brutally seize land that did not belong to them. It's about restoring the rights to those who have those rights. It's about taking it back. It's not a war for revenge. That's an important distinction that every Muslim must know when they are talking about this issue. And the reason why I mention all that is because it goes back to this particular point. In that Netanyahu wants to, wants to make it in terms of this Israel is fighting, dark, lightness is fighting dark. But in reality, when you look at it, the whole world now can see that it's a genocide and ethnic cleansing. Which leads me into the second point about the social media. I've seen some people say, Yeah, Sami, wallah, you exaggerate about this narrative issue. You exaggerate about the social media and the change in the wave. I see it sometimes on the social media. That in the end it means absolutely nothing. First of all, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yantiqu an al He doesn't speak from, from a vacuum. He doesn't speak lahu. He doesn't say words that mean nothing. Innahu la wahyun yuha. He receives divine revelation. So when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says ballighu anni wa law ayas convey from me even if it's just a verse. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that because it means something. There's something in the word. There's something in the verse that has an impact, that is significant, which means that even if you have no other power but to speak out to advance the cause of Islam, that in itself is significant for the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to have this as a hadith. When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says, He who sees something that is wrong, let him change it with his hand. But then he qualifies it. And if you cannot, if you find yourself with no power, if you find yourself with no army, no ability, no influence, let him change it with his tongue, with his words. Everyone has a tongue, everyone has the capacity to speak out. Speak out. And if you cannot speak out, the Prophet has given you another level. If you cannot, for whatever reason, condemn it in your heart, that's the weakest of faith. So for those who say that the narrative of the social media doesn't matter, take it up with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who told us that speaking out is an elevated form of resistance. The second point that's worth noting, if the shift in the narrative and the social media did not mean anything, why does Israel spend hundreds and millions of pounds to put YouTube adverts on videos that we watch on YouTube? The adverts are not targeted to Muhammad bin Salman or Muhammad bin Zayed or Erdogan or to King Abdullah of Jordan. I don't imagine they're sitting watching YouTube ads. The reason Israel spends that money is because they're targeting another demographic. They're targeting something else. Who are they targeting? They're targeting you. They're targeting Ra'il Am, the public opinion. Israel's government believes that it has to spend hundreds and millions of pounds to convince public opinion to be on its side. I ask every brother who tries to undermine the narrative, why does Israel take it seriously and spend hundreds and millions of pounds, but you cannot see its significance? 
Why is it that when the BBC apologized for falling short of journalistic standards with regards to how it covered the protest in London, why is it that when Rishi Sunak went to show his support to Tel Aviv, instead the president of Israel, Ishaq Herzog, did, berates him in front of the cameras and says, why is BBC not calling Hamas terrorists? Why does the president of Israel, why does it worry him so much that the BBC refuses to use Israel's terminology to describe it? Because they're worried about a change in the tide. What is the change they're worried about? They're worried that you will convince the world that the Palestinians are human and that their cause is just. I ask you, why does the Israeli go all out for the narrative but the brother sits at home and says, there's no point, it's useless. And Ibad Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَ سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا He who desires the Akhirah and strives for it, and he believes in Allah, his striving is rewarded, not the result. Ibad Allah, Allah is not asking you to deliver the change. Allah is seeing if you're willing to strive within the powers that he's given. Allah is the one who decides the outcome at all times. And the reason why I always tell people to read the Quran as a political book, as well as a religious book, and I'll explain why this is all relevant to Gaza, is because you'll note that, for example, when you're reading Surah Hud, you will notice that the MBA, the prophets who are mentioned in it, don't actually succeed in convincing their people. Not only that, Lut السلام, says in Surah Hud, it gets to a stage for Lut that he feels so helpless. The Prophet of Allah feels so helpless in the way that we might be feeling helpless today. Feels so helpless that he says, if only I had power or a powerful ally to resist you. In the point being that Lut believes he has nowhere to go. And Allah reminds him that I have decided their fate already. Allah is not asking you about the outcome. And this is why when people say, what is the point of it or what will it achieve? I say to you, leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Leave that to Allah to decide. Allah will decide the outcome when he wants, how he wants, as he wants. And he will not consult anybody. The choice you have is whether you want to have the honor of bringing about that outcome by striving within the means that you have. And I, brothers, I know every single one of you has talked about Palestine on social media. The shadow bans are because of you. The shadow bans on hashtag Palestine is because of you. The restricting of social media is because of you. Israel has deployed itself against you, not against the armies, against you. And this is why I always argue, and to answer your question, even though it sounds like I'm not giving anything tangible, but let me ask you this, to answer the question, if the Israelis believe it to be something that has concerned them so much that they have to exert effort, then keep going if for no other reason than that it's bothering them. Keep going if not for no other reason that they're concerned about it. If Allah has not given you the wisdom to see its relevance, they see the relevance. Use that as a basis and keep going. Keep talking about Palestine. Keep talking, raising awareness, showing people what's happening in Gaza because you're making the difference. Because what happens when you change public opinion, particularly amongst the younger generation, is that the next generation have a very different approach to politics, have a very different approach to foreign policy. Brothers, we might not see Palestine liberated in our lifetime, but remember that we're travelers in this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave success to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he entered Mecca. But brothers, as a political analyst, at that time, Mecca and Medina were still considered a backwater area by the Persians and by the Romans. It wasn't even considered worth conquering by the Persians and the Romans. But that doesn't mean that the Prophet ﷺ didn't achieve a mighty victory. Because the victory is not in Fatah Mecca itself. It's in what Fatah Mecca meant as the pedestal through which Islam was able to spread. Ibrahim ﷺ, by the time that he died, he was in a small village near the Kaaba. He had two sons. The angels had told him that your progeny will be like the stars. He never saw this progeny. He never saw them. But he was content because he believed, Alhamdulillah, in my lifetime I've set the stage for those who are coming after me. Nuh alayhi salam, 900 years he's calling to his people. And still, ma amanu illa qalila. Only a few believed in him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them with the flood. Do you say that Nuh alayhi salam failed? Hasha. Nuh didn't fail. 
Nuh alayhi salam was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah made it clear to us in the Quran, in these examples, that Allah decides the outcome. Allah decides it. Don't judge your efforts based on the outcome. Judge your efforts based on the level of your striving within the powers that you have. For you don't know the outcome that Allah has chosen for you or for everything else. And if I were to ask you in terms of building on this the question, what tangible impact can it have? Keir Starmer is now rolling back on his statements. Initially he said that uh, Israel has the right to cut off electricity and water and the like. Now he's saying, no, 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 wallahi, I didn't say it. He doesn't say wallahi, but he says, I didn't say it. Now you have Sadiq Khan, who didn't want to cause a fuss. Suddenly now he's coming out and saying, we demand immediate ceasefire. That's because of the pressure. And when people say, where is the outcome? Remember, one of the things that I argue is that this ummah is not weak. The tragedy is that it believes it's weak. If I were to ask every single one of you, have you sent a letter to your representative yet? Half of you may say yes, half of you will say no, 100%. If I tell you, have you pressured your local MPs? Half of you will say yes, half of you say, wallahi, there's no point to it whatsoever. So you have the power to do so, but you choose not to deploy this power. So, why, so how do you expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to intervene and amplify that effort? When Allah says, Inna Allah la ma bi hatta ma bi anfusihim, People always tend to, uh, com to interpret this verse as in terms of the ibadah actions, which is true, but that's only half of the, a half of the verse. Part of the meaning is in whether the ummah is ready to strive or not. The story of Musa alayhi salam, when he tells his people go and fight, and they say, اذهب أنت وربك فقاتل إن نحن ها هنا قاعدون. We go with you and your Lord and go and fight, and we will stay here. Because they're the Qawman Jabbarin, they are people that we don't want to fight. Allah bans it for them for 40 years because they're not willing to strive within their efforts in order to achieve what they have. So going back to your question, we've changed the narrative, yes. Global opinion is increasing in favor of Palestine, yes. What does this mean? How does it translate? What it translates is greater pressure on the negotiating table. Greater pressure on international relations between the US and the rest of the world. There's a member diplomat from the G7 who told the Financial Times that we can no longer rely on the Global South for support in Ukraine against Russia. That's something that's deeply concerning for them. You think it's insignificant for them, they're concerned now they will not be able to rally any support for Ukraine after the double standards that they've shown with regards to Palestine and Israel. I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that it seems as though this is a very significant moment in human history, uh, and particularly modern history. And before October 7th, we had Mohammed bin Salman on Fox News saying that they were getting day in, day out closer to a, a normalization deal. We had Rajat Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, shaking hands with Netanyahu uh, and making deals for gas pipelines, making deals for trade corridors and such. So there was a movement towards greater ties in it. You touched upon what Netanyahu said in the United Nations previously. Has the situation changed in six months time or in a year's time or two years time when the dust settles on the rubble of Gaza? Is it the case that it will be business as usual? They will wait for ties to die down uh, or the situation to diffuse and then the normalization ties will continue and Erdogan will continue his trade deals and his gas pipelines? Or has the situation got to the stage where the whole paradigm, the whole dynamic of the region has changed since October the 7th uh, irrevocably? This is an answer that breaks my heart and, and I hope you'll be patient with me on this. The Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has made every effort to let the Israelis know that what happens in Gaza will not affect normalization process. Initially, the Saudi Crown Prince buckled. He felt concerned with the raging public opinion. So he restored the word ihtilal, colonizer or occupier, to the official Saudi statements. During bin Salman's reign, we've seen the easing out of this word colonization and starting to refer to Israel as Israel, as he's trying to push normalization. Initially, bin Salman panicked, so he embarked on two moves. He restored the word colonization, ihtilal, and he also lifted the restrictions on the haram with regards to dua for Palestine. During Ramadan, a set of rules were introduced. On paper, the rule said that qunut or dua should be kept short, but what it meant was it was a for the imams to let them know, don't dwell too long on the issue of Palestine. I'm trying to normalize ties here. Don't rally the population with regards to these causes or all the like. And many imams were sacked when they made dua for Palestine. 
Bin Salman lifted some of those restrictions and we saw in the Haram, they were making dua for Palestine, making dua for Gaza. After about one week, one week and a half, the Saudi crown prince began to feel that maybe he can carefully start to navigate that public opinion. So Mashaykh started appearing in Saudi Arabia. In their lessons for the past two weeks, the, the main lesson that's being taught now in the Saudi mosque is Ta'at Wali Al-Amr, obeying the ruler. And there was even a, a video that's gone viral of a sheikh who said that Muslims, that, that you guys, you're not qualified to talk about these issues. You know nothing about it. Your analyses are like those of slugs. And your, your, your constant talking about the issue is burdensome for our rulers. So we should trust our rulers and stop talking about these issues. There are many anecdotes of brothers and sisters coming back from Saudi Arabia expressing surprise at the lack of discussion in the mosques with regards to what's taking place in Gaza. Saudi media, you'll, if anybody who's seen the Al Arabiya interview with Khalid Mish'al, you would think that it was the Israeli media interviewing Khalid Mish'al, the way the presenter went after him. She asked legitimate questions, but the way that she went in on him and demanding he apologize and the like, you would think that it was an Israeli media that was interviewing Khalid Mish'al. Saudi commentators online, you can find this, this isn't analysis, you can find it. They are saying that the blame for this latest escalation is all on the Palestinians. It's on Ikhwan al muslimin It's on the extremists. And that's why the Saudi Mashaykh are warning Muslims of the dangers of the extremist ideologies such as the Muslim Brotherhood or the like. This is their words, not mine. The Saudi Crown Prince last week had a, a qimma, an event in Riyadh, an investment event with the ASEAN countries, with Indonesia and Malaysia. In that conference, he gave a speech for five minutes. In that speech, he dedicated exactly 32 seconds, 32.25 if I remember according to Adobe Premiere Pro. 32.25 seconds to Gaza. He didn't call it a war or a conflict or a genocide or ethnic cleansing. He called it an unfortunate violence. He didn't mention Israel by name, nor did he condemn the Israelis. He condemned all civilian deaths and urged a, for a call for a ceasefire and then made a passing mention to 1967 borders so that we could say, that bin Salman is going to delay normalization because now he's talking about 1967 borders and in the Fox News he was saying he would settle for anything that makes their lives easier. So bin Salman sent the message to the Israelis that it won't affect normalization but gave enough for his supporters to argue with us and say bin Salman has said over and over that there will be no normalization without a Palestinian state. Which is absolute nonsense. Not only that, Whoever of you opens the video of the Davos in the Desert Investment Forum from three days ago, you'll notice there's a very famous speaker there. His name is Jared Kushner, who is a keynote speaker, who is managing millions of Saudi money that Saudi has given permission to be invested in Israeli companies. So all the signs coming out of Saudi Arabia are, as in the words of the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee with the Senate four days ago or five days ago, time's a bit of a blur for me these days, as it is for everybody, I assume, given the hectic events. He said that normalization with Saudi is not finished because the Saudis are normalizing with us because they want protection from Iran and Palestine has nothing to do with that at all. Saudi Arabia, when the UAE, so Oman and Kuwait canceled all the festivals and events and all of their front pages in their news is about Gaza, is about the destruction and, and blaming the Israelis or the like. The UAE, they were a bit slow and a bit shy about it. They blamed the Palestinians but gave aid and then cancelled the festivals and also allowed their commentators to run wild in criticizing the Israelis. For those who know of the UAE, UAE, you don't express an opinion except within the framework and parameters that the government allows. So when you see UAE commentators loudly criticizing Israel, that means that Bin Zaid has given the order to let them go loose. But the Saudi crown prince, because, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, Shakira is visiting in the weekend, because Tyson Fury and Ngano are fighting in the weekend, Turki al sheikh the head of the General Entertainment Authority, today posted on Facebook, saying, how dare people suggest that I cancel Riyadh season for the sake of Gaza? Name me one football match that was cancelled for a political event. In his Facebook post that you can find online, 
Google, mashallah, Sheikh Google is really good at translating. You'll see he doesn't even express sympathy for what's happening in Gaza. So if you're sitting in the US and you're seeing all these signs from Saudi Arabia, put your hands up if you believe that normalization is finished with Saudi Arabia. Put your hands up if you believe that it's still on the table. Those are the signs coming out of Saudi Arabia and coming out of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. But it's important to highlight here. I was on a plane once and, and somebody said, I know you, you're the anti-MBS guy. And I told him, Wallahi, I'm not the anti-MBS guy. It's just there's certain things I'm not happy about. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, for example. We've seen his statements, they're getting stronger. They're getting louder. But it's worth noting that these statements are not directed at us. They are directed at angry Turks. Erdogan in the beginning was unprecedentedly soft on Israel. He didn't want to call them out. He wanted to be mediator and the like. When Turks took to the streets in their thousands, secular Turkey in their thousands took to the streets, there was that viral video of that Turkish man who said, yeah, Erdogan, you called us out in 2016 and we came out and rescued you. Rescued you. Call us out now for Gaza. Yet here, enough. Erdogan, as the Turks get more and more angry and they start shooting fireworks at the Israeli embassies, forcing Israel to withdraw his diplomats, Erdogan is scrambling to ensure that he's not seen to be behind the Turkish trend, which is why he's going to be giving a speech at a mass rally in Turkey that is designed to appease the Turks, not to offend the Israelis. Even when you look at all the other countries like King Abdullah of Jordan, there was a protest today in front of the Israeli embassy. Jordan police drove back the protesters away from the Israeli embassy. And that's why I think that when we talk about normalization of ties, I think that what's happening at this moment in time is given the public anger and given that you guys are shouting and roaring on social media, the regimes are uncomfortable and they're trying to navigate. They are throwing a meat of 1967 borders while telling Jared Kushner that it's fine, we'll still normalize ties. But it's worth noting that the fact that they have to talk about 1967 borders, the fact that UAE has to cancel festivals, the fact that Oman and Kuwait, Oman has always stood by the Palestinian cause, but the fact that the other countries are all trying to scramble to show that they're standing with Palestine is not because they want to, it's because they're worried about you. And this is where I go back to the point about whether you know your strength or not. When the Ummah says we're incapable, it's not that you're incapable, it's that you don't know what you're capable of achieving. Right now the regimes are wary that this protest, this public opinion, will spur a movement that at best will topple the regimes, and at, at worst will topple the regimes, and at best it will force a change in policy. So to answer the question directly, normalization of ties is still well on the table. Saudi airspace is still open for the Israelis. There are planes going back and forth uh, between Abu Dhabi and between uh, the Saudi Arabia. Morocco has not reversed normalization of ties. Morocco in 2000 reversed normalization on the Intifada. This time they haven't reversed normalization of ties. Sudan, they're in a war, they're not, they, I'm not even sure they remember if they normalized ties with Israel or not. Bahrain has not normalized ties or the like, and neither have the UAE, which suggests that they're worried about public opinion, but it's not at a level yet where they're willing to change. And normalization, when this dies down, there are even suggestions now that I've seen some videos of some prominent speakers, and I promise I'll finish on this sentence. So, some prominent speakers who are saying, I'm sure you've all heard it, there's a movement now to prepare Muslims for normalization, that it's a good thing that it will bring economic benefits, that if we are consumers and stakeholders, they will take us seriously, that we should normalize ties and that it's our narrow vision that is making us averse to normalization of ties with Israel. And this notion is being pushed and it's even being suggested, billah, that Saudi Arabia may even normalize ties with Israel in exchange for a ceasefire and Bin Salman will say to the Ummah, I led from the front, I got the ceasefire, Ya Ibad Allah celebrate. Of course, anyone that hasn't asked a question already, you can post it on the group, the Muslim World uh, Telegram group, and that's the actual uh, address if you haven't posted a new one. I'm just going to pick one of these questions and add to it, if, uh, if you don't mind. First one is, uh, what shall we do to help? Can we boycott, or shall we boycott? But I just want to add to that, uh, add a few layers to that question. So the question is, you know, politically, what is it that we should be doing with ourselves? Uh, to add a few more points to that, Keir Starmer, as you mentioned earlier, in a very notorious now uh, LBC interview when he was asked, do the Israelis have the right to cut off the water to the, the food, the electricity? He said, I believe they do have that right. And then, of course, he backtracked after that. And that, 
that created a huge backlash amongst Muslims in general, but also Muslim councillors. A lot of um, Labour uh, members have now resigned, Muslim Labour members have resigned because of it. However, despite everything that's happened, many from our community still have faith in the efficacy of the political process. When I say that, I mean voting, I mean petitioning MPs. They believe that this is still a worthwhile process to enact change. So what, if I broaden the question a little bit, what are your thoughts on how we can engage politically as Muslims in the UK, or how best to engage politically as Muslims in the UK to bring about positive change? I understand that my answer might not please everybody. But I do think one of the reasons that Sky News... I understand that my answer might not please everybody. But I do think one of the reasons that Sky News, their coverage of the conflict has not been as bad as the BBC and why they've been able to bring Palestinian voices and why they've raised doubts about Israeli fake news is because I've been to Sky News studios. There are a lot of Muslims working there. There are a lot of Muslims there in Sky News who are lobbying and actually having an impact in terms of the guests who are brought in and in terms of how presenters pose their questions. It may not be perfect, but it's markedly different from what it used to be many, many years ago with regards to Sky News. When the foreign correspondent for Sky News says that we should not report the, the, the beheaded baby story because we haven't been able to verify it, Sky News was once the most right-wing channel you could find here in the UK. The reason they're doing it is because we have a presence in these institutions. The reason that Keir Starmer is under pressure and that he revised his words about the electricity and water and the like is because he felt the pressure from the Muslim councillors and he felt the pressure from the Muslim members and he saw the polls which suggest that there is a 75% drop now in Muslim support for the Labour Party. I understand that this is not the outcome or power that you wish you had, but it is power. I understand that it's not the result that you want, but it could have been worse. And I'm not saying this from a defeatist mentality. I'm saying that compare where we were before and where we are now and where we could be going forward. This is why I ask the question in terms of who has contacted the representative, who's put pressure, who's bombarded them the way the Israelis bombard their MPs. I've seen the Israeli lobby when they, when they bombard the MPs. They are relentless. They are relentless. They are hounding them in their ear until the person turns around and says, okay, okay, Israel has a right to self-defense. I ask you, do we Muslims do the same? Do we Muslims strive with the powers that we have to do the same? At this moment in time, Sue Gray, the chief of staff of the Labour Party, has organized two emergency meetings with Keir Starmer, warning him that there is a crisis now because the Muslim members are now going to the mosque and threatening not to vote for the Labour Party. Whether Keir Starmer will buckle or not, we don't know. But I know that when he went to the mosque in South Wales, when he hoodwinked that Imam Miskeen, he went there because no other mosque in London would take him and he was desperate to show that I still value you and your votes are still valuable. When David Lammy and Yvette Cooper went to that mosque in fin is it fin Tottenham or Finsbury Park, the reason they went there is not because they wanted to, it's because there's a storm coming and they're trying to fend off that storm. Now there are two ways we can look at that storm. We can look at that storm and say let's amplify it and really give it to them so that they listen to us. Or we say, wallahi, the efforts of our elders who came here with nothing and built the mosques for us and got all the planning permission and strived to establish these institutions for us and strived to put us through education and worked day and night in order to create for us a haven where we would not have to do what they had to do. Do we respect those efforts and say, wallahi, you know what, all of it was for nothing. Salamu alaikum, bye bye, and you walk through the door. Or do you turn around and say, okay, I have a foot through the door. How can I amplify this? Sadiq Khan, it may have taken three weeks to call for a ceasefire. But the reason he's called for a ceasefire is because we made it untenable for him to no longer say anything. Ibadallah, victory comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah decides the best course. Sometimes we plan. We plan, but Allah is the best of planners. Sometimes we plan and we have an ideal outcome. This is what I believe to be the best outcome. But how many times has Allah given you examples where you've thought something was the best outcome, but he gives you an even better outcome? That's what tawakkul ala Allah means. Tawakkul doesn't mean sit in your home and do nothing. Tawakkul ala Allah means striving, believing that there is a good outcome, but Allah, please give me a better outcome. I argue, and this is, what, this is, this is my personal opinion, and I appreciate it won't please everybody in this room. I argue there's still more we can do to put pressure on the Labour Party. 
There's still more we can do to put pressure on Keir Starmer. I think that we're already seeing signs that he's buckling. We're already seeing signs that the Labour Party is buckling. The question I ask you is this, do we walk away now when we're seeing them start to buckle? Or do we say, I see it. I I've seen the, I don't know what they call it. Uh, Alhamdulillah, nobody here plays poker, but there is a tell, that's what it's called. I see the tell. And it's about whether we're going to press that home by hounding them or whether we're going to take our foot off the gas because Labour are winning by-elections. They are winning by-elections of the Conservatives. So you're between two choices. Do we give up that power that for years we painstakingly tried to create? Do we give it up and Keir Starmer wins anyway and we no longer even have any influence because he's now realized he can win without us? And he may not, but you never know. Allah, maybe that might be his conclusion. Or do we use that power and strike that fear as we have in forcing him to roll back on statements and force him to be able to do so? Can the mosque come together with a joint statement, for example? Can we get our mashayikh to mobilize people into... I was speaking to a hackathon last week and there was somebody trying to create an app where he can facilitate for the elders who perhaps don't speak English well, they can actually get the letter written and printed and sent on their behalf to the members of parliament so that they're hounded. So when they see all those letters, because I ask you, Take an example of Piers Morgan. We're seeing Piers Morgan. Does any of you believe that Piers Morgan has any real opinions about anything? No. Piers Morgan is so happy with the views that he's getting from the Muslim guests that he keeps bringing them. Piers Morgan doesn't care about Palestine-Israel. He probably has no idea about the history. But Piers Morgan sees millions of views and he thinks, Wallahi, these Muslims are bringing me views. Bring them on. Many MPs are like that. Many MPs don't have a strong stance. Many MPs take a position because the one who is loudest in their ear has forced them in the position. Ibadallah, how loud are you in the other ear? How mobilized are you? When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sent Musab ibn Umair to Medina and said Ja'far ibn Abi Talib to Habasha, he didn't do so willy-nilly. The Prophet وسلم, sent them because he believed they were effective interlocutors to talk to people and to raise awareness about the deen. The reason why Bilal ibn Rabah anhu, celebrated the Treaty of Hudaybiyah when Umar ibn Khattab believed it to be something that was bad and then he was rebuked and had to apologize for telling the Prophet Alasna al Haq. The reason why Bilal ibn Rabah celebrated because Bilal said, wait a minute guys, 10 years of peace. We can give da'wah now. We're free to go give da'wah because he was convinced that when we mobilize with our message, we convince people. What's the fastest growing religion? It's Islam, we convince people. And that's what I meant when I say the Ummah is not weak, it believes it's weak. If I ask you here, who's met their MP? Who's gone to the office? Most of you will say you haven't, because you believe there was no point. You are like the person who waits for the victory from Allah without doing anything for it. Allah has not told you to decide the outcome. Allah has said, what's in your power? So you said, what can we do? If you can go visit your MP, go visit them. If you can write to them, go write to them. If you can hound them on social media, hound them on social media. If all, in terms of voting, the way I see it is this. Everybody's free to vote as they wish. Yeah. But what I will say is this. We have an opportunity here in this war of narratives, this battle of narratives. We have an opportunity to get Keir Starmer to reverse course. I truly believe that if this ummah mobilizes properly, if this ummah uses what is at its disposal, I believe we can convince Keir Starmer to call for a ceasefire. I believe we can actually mobilize and get that to happen. I believe the reason that we haven't is because maybe half of the ummah is mobilizing and the other half is telling that half, Wallah, you guys are wasting your time. Like, astaghfirullah No, I, I won't use the example. I'm already in trouble for using another example, which I regret deeply and I will never use again. No, no, no. I, 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 won't, I, won't, I, won't, I won't use, use the example because it's a very harsh example. But you can imagine wh which way I'm alluding to. When half the ummah strive for something and the other half try to demoralize them by telling them what's the point of what you're doing. Don't be like this ummah. Wallahi, I promise you guys. And I, and I, I promise, wallahi, I finish on this point. <laughs> Brothers, I promise you. I, alhamdulillah, spent a lot of time with my grandfather who was a mujahid in Algeria against the French. And I was lucky enough to sit at his feet and hear the stories. And they were horrific stories. I remember the torture marks on his body. I remember the aunties with their breasts chopped off. I remember the stories that they used to tell about how his brother, 18 years of age, killed in cold blood by the French. I remember the stories about the massacres, 30,000 killed in one week. On, in the same year that the UN convention was signed that every man is born free. I remember those stories. But I also remember my grandfather saying 
that what he was proud of was Allah gave him the honor of being the tool to achieve an outcome. That when he was in the mountains, he had no idea that he would be alive to see independence. He said, we were all resigned to die in the mountains. He said, the French, there was never a point where Algeria was militarily superior to France. There was no point in the entire war for liberation that Algeria was superior to France in military might. No point whatsoever. The Algerians in the mountains believed that they would die before they see independence. Allah gave them the honor of seeing independence. Why? Because Allah rewarded their striving. Allah rewarded their, 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 their means through which they deployed in order to try to bring about that change. Ibadallah, I'm not asking you to fight. I'm asking you to use the powers that you have. Because wallahi ladhi la ilaha illahu. If you go back to and look in the mirror today and you tell yourself, have I used all the powers at my disposal to try to bring about change here, even in case Thomas trance, I promise you, not a single person here can honestly hand on heart say, I've done everything in the powers that Allah has given me. And that's what I mean in that, Ya Ibadallah, I'm always an optimist with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm convinced that because He's the most high, the most wise, and the most powerful, Allah knows what He's doing. Wallahu ghalibun ala amri. Allah knows what He's doing. I don't have Allah's wisdom. I don't dare contend with Allah's wisdom. I don't dare to contend with Allah's glory. Allah, the outcome is yours. But what an honor it is for me personally, and it will be for you as well. What an honor it is to go and say something on social media and have the Israelis panic. What an honor it is to see brothers mobilizing because I told them they could retweet. What an honor it is to be considered part of this struggle. What an honor it is to be a tool that is used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise awareness for the Palestinians. And I feel so happy that the, when I see the Israelis spending so much on PR because I didn't spend a penny. Because we didn't spend a penny either. Alhamdulillah, we're causing jitters there as well. And that's why I say you in terms of, use the powers that you have. And I promise you, Allah says in the Quran, min haythu la tahtasib. Allah gives you risk and rewards you from where you never knew it would come from. You could be chasing this outcome. And the best outcome is one you never even considered. And Allah will bring it. But it won't come unless we strive. So let's focus on the striving. You ask me about the outcome. I don't know the outcome. I don't know what will happen. What I do know is the Ummah has power and we, we're not even at 50% yet. Let's get there first and then let's talk about the outcome, inshallah. And if I could just add to that a question, one more thing in relation to our actions and what we can do, and that's this is being asked as well. Um, boycotts, divestments, uh, and sanctions, BDS. Uh, do, you, do you believe in the efficacy of that? Is that something that is part of this, this, this um, activism that we should be engaging in? You've talked about lobbying and pressuring our MPs, maybe voting strategically, uh, not giving our votes and making them earn it. Uh, what for BDS, if you can be very quick as well, there are quite sure. questions. I'll, I'll be very quick, inshallah. I'm aware that it's 9.20, inshallah. I don't want to delay for too long. But one of the things I will say is this. Boycotts work. It does hurt them. The reason why Israel is trying to ban BDS is because they're worried that it works. The reason why they're lobbying to ban BDS, if it doesn't hurt you, why would you be bothered by it? Imam Shafi'i once said that if a fool speaks to you, don't reply to him. For if you reply to him, you have pleased him. And if you ignore him, he almost dies in anguish. So when the Israelis are responding to the BDS banning, it's because they're worried that BDS works. But more important than that, brothers, support each other. Support each other's businesses. Support each other's efforts. If you see a brother who's in a position to do something, go to him and tell him, Akhi, go, I've got your back. Let, let's go. If there's a protest, go together. If there's a, a social media campaign you guys can do, go. I've seen brothers who are gathering together to organize these apps, these hackathons, all the like. The point is, support each other. Boycotts work, but boycotts don't work when there's no alternative. And the alternative should be from us. Sometimes, and I'll be honest, I feel like I'm contributing a little bit when I go to the shop and I see Turkish products like Bodrum or the like, and I see the French products, and I think, wallah, the French have never apologized. They, they show no remorse. I used to really like the Evian water, but wallah, I'm going to go for Safiya or I'm going to go for Hayat. I'm gonna, ju just, just because I want to support that. These attitudes, they all work. They do genuinely work. You think it's, wallah, I feel like it's a small victory. It has meaning, guys. And, and, the, and, and, and it's worth noting here. When Heraclius asked Abu Sufyan, who are those who support the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Who are those who are delivering him to this efficacy, this effectiveness? He said, it's the lowest of our society. It's Bilal ibn Rabah, the former slave. 
It's Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the shepherd. It's these individuals. The reason Allah chose these Sahaba, these Mubashireen bil Jannah, those who are going to give Jannah, Bilal Barabah, it was said that they, someone, I think the Prophet, I won't put it on the Prophet, but it is said that a dream was seen where Bilal Barabah's footsteps were in front of someone else in Jannah. So they went and they asked Bilal, what is an act that you do regularly? Because I want to know how it is that you, you're ahead of me in Jannah. And he thought and he thought and he thought and he said, well, I, I, I pray to Raqqa every, every time I make wudu, for example. Allah elevated the deen through people who hashahum. They are, they are giants in our eyes, but were considered by Quraysh to be the lowest. The point is, everybody has value here and everybody can contribute to this. And it's important that you support each other in this. That's how we make a difference, inshallah. There's a question I want to bring it back to the Israel Palestine conflict and you know, broaden that out a little bit as this is being asked as well. And it's in relation to what for the future of this conflict. Obviously, we have very little understanding as to what's going to happen in the next week, two weeks, a month, and so on. But the two state solution that's been proposed for some time, many think is dead in the water. Two state solution uh, where we have two states living side by side Israel and Palestine. Uh, because of the fact that Israel have built uh, many, many settlements, I think there are 600,000 Israeli settlers living in the West Bank illegally. The facts on the ground have changed such that it seems as though to many the two state solution is off the table. One state solution, where in which Israel absorbs the Palestinians into a single state, also seems untenable, such that an ethno state as Israel, the Jewish state as Israel, would surely not ever consider such a situation. The question is, what is it that we can propose, given the circumstances that we see, for a way forward in relation to Palestine? One of the things that I love about my job as a risk consultant is that I, I never actually have to answer questions. I can present five different scenarios and, and, and they pay for it. And that's what I'm going to do here. The, the reason that it's a difficult question to answer is that Israel may well get its way in Gaza and there may well be an ethnic cleansing and a genocide. We ask Allah to protect them, but Allah in his hikmah will decide what is the best situation. But the reason I want to address this point from another angle is that when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was building the Khandaq, the trench, all of the tribes of Arabia had gathered against him. And he was digging the trench and he said to his Sahaba, I see the pearls of, of Persia, of, of, of Qisra. And the Munafiqeen, they laughed at him. They say, SubhanAllah, the whole country has gathered against him. And he's here talking about the pearls of Persia and the like. The point here being is that the Prophet Sallallahu even at that moment, still believed that a positive outcome was possible despite all the odds being stacked against him. I'll bring back to the example of Algeria, only because it, my maternal side and, and, and they're very, Algerians are very loud about their history, mashallah. Like it's something they hold very dear. But one thing that is worth noting is that in 1945, when... 30,000 Algerians were, were killed and massacred for taking to the streets and demanding independence. The French were convinced that because of such a brutal massacre, and put it in comparison, even though comparing death rates is a horrible thing to do, but 5,000 Palestinians have died in the past three weeks. 30,000 Algerians died in a week in 1945. Slaughtered, massacred after France was liberated from Nazi Germany. When the world was saying the Allies had won and the global order had been established, they went and massacred in Stif, in Gelma, in Karat, and these other places. The reason why I mention Algeria as an example is that even in this doom and gloom that we're seeing in Gaza terrain in Palestine, and it makes our hearts bleed deeply. And there is a, a picture that I always mentioned that, that I saw an artist put on Facebook of the ghost of a daughter with her, with her hand on her dad's back. And she's, and she's saying to him, Baba, don't worry, where I am, no bombs can reach me. And it reminds you of, you know, you see the iman of the Palestinians in that the reason their faith is so strong is because they believe that their dead go straight to Jannah. There's no limbo. There's no day of judgment. Straight to Jannah al-Firdaus al-A'la. You know, farihina, they are happy. And Allah gives us the reassurance because even in the ayah itself, it says, That Allah says to them that, that when, they, when they are calling back to us, they say, don't grieve for us. We're no longer feeling any fear or, or sadness anymore. And that's why when the Muslim is an optimist, it's because he knows that it doesn't matter how many they kill in Palestine, straight to Jannah, inshallah, alhamdulillah, ma'a shuhada wa salihin, and with the prophets al anbiya, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with everything that they didn't have in this dunya. Allah has promised that to them. And that's why we don't grieve for them, alhamdulillah. 
Our hearts break at what's happening. It breaks at the dhulm. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has delivered them straight to Jannah, alhamdulillah. The reason why I say that is to highlight and emphasize that in 1945, 30,000 Algerians were killed. In the declassified French documents, it says that the French got together and they said, from this day forth, no Algerian will dare take to the streets against us again. We've taught them such a bloody lesson. They know France's power now, the same way Netanyahu is trying to do in Gaza. That they know our power now, they will never dare to do so. Ibad Allah, Allah had written that only 17 years later, 132 years of French occupation finished. They were kicked out, ousted. They were ousted even though the Algerians were never military superior to the French. Allah ousted them. Allah gave the power, gave the ability and they were out. We don't know the outcome or how it can take place. And that's why when it comes to scenario, what might happen next? What might happen next may be a disastrous scenario in terms of what we consider. There may well be another Nakba. There may well be the Palestinians might be ousted to Sinai Peninsula. It may well be that Netanyahu annexes Gaza. Maybe. We don't know. And that may look so disastrous to us. But history shows that it doesn't last. That anything can change in an instant. And that's why, and, and I know that I've repeated this point, but this is why I want to emphasize. And I appreciate, I've seen some comments sometimes, people say Sami gives false hope. It's not false hope. Once you leave the outcome to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you feel powerful. Once you know that Allah is in control of it, you feel strong. Because you say, okay, I'm not responsible for the outcome. Let me strive, I'm responsible for the striving. I don't have the ilm or the knowledge as to what the solution should be. But I do know what's wrong and what should be resisted. I do know what is wrong and what should be fought. I do know what, what, what should be prevented from happening. I do know I should raise awareness for the Palestinians. I do know I should support the causes that help the Palestinians. I do know that I should convince the world of the justice. I do know that I should give da'wah. And da'wah is not just calling people to the deen, it's calling people to justice as well. Allah has tied Islam and justice together. Ibn Taymiyyah says, Allah allows a state that doesn't believe in him to survive as long as it's just, but does not tolerate a Muslim state that is unjust. For Allah can tolerate shirk with justice, but cannot tolerate Islam with injustice. Allah does not tolerate his name to be associated with oppression and injustice. The reality is you have the ability, the da'wah and the kit, and that's why I want to focus. The answer is this, two-state solution is not happening. Blinken is proposing it in order to prepare Netanyahu to annex the territories and then try to get the Palestinians to agree to a limited territory. The Palestinians will never agree to it. There's no two-state solution. One state solution, the Israelis will never agree to it because one state solution means that the Palestinians are the majority so that in any elections, the Palestinians will vote their own president, they'll vote their own prime minister. There's no way the Israelis will accept it. But the scenario that we may get is a ceasefire. But what we will see, and I know that it sounds vague, but I think... From, from a political perspective, in, in my industry, this is all anybody is talking about. That whatever the outcome of this latest round, relations between the US and the global south will never be the same. And all of the reports from the corporate entities that I work alongside when we advise the corporate clients, all of the reports have a consensus that Ukraine is now going to be affected, that ties in Russia's power is going to be affected. That China is going to have an easier, easier rise even though I'm not fond of either power. That the global order now is going to tilt because the global south, the Arab street, will no longer trust the Americans ever again. They will no longer see them. Muslims are now saying in America that Trump wants to ban Arabs from entering but Biden is killing them. And that's why I think that, and this is where I come back to this point, and I'll finish on this sentence. You may believe that you are helpless and insignificant. But I sit in these closed door rooms with these diplomats, European diplomats. I've advised the State Department before. I've sat with them before. Wallahi, they take your opinion seriously. Wallahi, when you guys roar, wallahi, they take it seriously. They get concerned. They ask me questions. What could it reach? What's the potential? What, what, like, how bad is it? How scared are the regimes of it? These are the questions I get. These are the questions I get paid to answer. And of course, you're right and you say, they are very worried about the public opinion. The public opinion is going to bring sweeping changes. If you allow free and fair elections, Muslims will win. And you better fix your policy because at the end, these regimes won't survive if you keep having them to go against their own people. And they're noticing it with Sisi, they're noticing it with Bin Zayed and the like. And that's because we're doing it. And that's why, and, and this is the final sentence. Don't be the one who stays at home and does nothing. 
for wallahi even in an act that you think is insignificant I analyze it and sit in the room with the diplomats and I see how scared they get about it. I see that they sit with media and say, how can we convince them to go back home? How can we convince them that it's futile? And that's why when I see a brother who says it's futile, I say, subhanallah, the greatest gift for the Israelis. Subhanallah. Don't be that person, brothers. Talk about Allah and keep going. The outcome is for Allah. The victory belongs to Allah. The glory belongs to Allah. But the battle and the struggle is ours. And what an honor that is. There's one more question and we'll close with this because we are running out of time. So very quickly. Because I know a lot of people have been asking the same question in various different forms, and it's relation to the wider region in relation to what's going on in, in, in Gaza. For example, what is Iran's role in all of this, uh, and what is the likelihood of this spilling over? We've seen that Hezbollah in southern Lebanon have been taking as, uh, strikes, water strikes into Israel, and, and they're exchanging strikes at this moment. What uh, role have Iran been playing? Is there a likelihood this could spill over into a wider conflict? And someone even asked the furthermore, China and Russia, have they actually played any kind of influential role in this at all? Uh, so, and if I could just add one more point to that, could this situation be a catalyst to a wider unity amongst Muslims and Muslim countries and a move away from the unipolar US dominated world order? In terms of Russia and China, Russia and China are using the opportunity for PR efforts to say to the Muslims, look how bad the Americans is and look how we're standing on your side. But I don't think any Muslim can buy it when they see what Russia has done in Libya and in Syria. I think that Putin, Putin talks a good game, but the amount of Muslim blood on his hands is unreal. I think that when it comes to China, China puts the Uyghurs in concentration camps. And when it sees the Muslims celebrate China as an alternative power, they taunt the Uyghurs and they go and they say to them, look at this Ummah that you talk about that's celebrating me as a rise in power in Africa. They talk about me as an alternative to the Americans or the like. And I've seen Uyghurs with their hearts full when they look me in the eye and they say, Sammy, why do Muslims do this? Why do they talk about China in this way when they do this to us? I tell them, Wallahi, Wallah, Ghalibun ala amri. I'm very sorry, I have no idea what to say to them. Brothers, China and Russia are not a positive alternative at all. When people talk about multipolar world, they talk like it's a good thing. Multipolar world means more chaos. In chaos, there is opportunity, but there is also a lot of killing. There's also a lot of violence, a lot of corruption, a lot of oppression. There is an Arab saying that says sometimes people talk about an issue that, you know, the Arab has, We have no camel in this race. And we are celebrating as if we have a camel in the race. At what point have you seen China come out and say, Wallahi, the Muslim rights are, are the top and I'm giving freedom to the Uyghurs of the like? Never. Russia, when it goes into Syria, bombards. Even Idlib now is being bombarded by Russian planes. Idlib in Syria is being bombarded by Russian planes. Putin receives Hamas and does a nice PR exercise and then bombs Idlib and, and kills the Syrians there. And then the Muslim turns around and says, you see, Putin is getting involved. Yes, Putin. In terms of the Iranian influence, and uh, I get criticized a lot for this, but primarily because I, the, the wound is still fresh when Qasim Soleimani, the Iranian general, in, in, as part of ceasefire agreements, he would load buses full of Sunni populations and then receive buses of Shia populations and he would swap the demographics to try to create the Shia crescent from Iran all the way to Lebanon. I, the, the wound is still fresh of the Hashd al-Shaabi in Iraq who raised the flag and said the revenge of Hussein takes place today. And they went into Mosul and they started massacring local civilians or the like. The Houthis who are fighting in Yemen, I know everybody likes to blame the Saudis and the like, and the Saudis have done destruction in Yemen, but the Houthis are in their seventh war to establish an imama because they believe that it is haram for anybody who is not Ahl al-Bayt to rule. They believe that it is wajib to keep fighting and fighting and fighting until somebody from Ahl al-Bayt rules and that Ahl al-Bayt are superior to all the other Muslims. Whereas the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after he died, we know it was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq anhu, by Shura he was chosen, and then Umar al-Khattab anhu, then Uthman bin Affan, then Ali bin Abi Talib, the Muslims chose via Shura, not on the basis of Ahl al-Bayt. So when I see that Iran has probably killed more of its own brothers than it has any of the enemies that it claims that it has, this is what leads me to hesitate in terms of celebrating Iran's role. Nevertheless, Iran has been a key part in helping the Palestinian factions to resist Israel, yes. It has helped to train them how to build weapons, yes. 
Sometimes we hear leaked recordings of Abu Marzoug in Hamas where he turns around and he says that the, there was a leaked recording, you can find it online. He says um, the Iranians exaggerate in terms of the support that they give us. But nevertheless, you cannot deny that they have supported the Palestinian cause. One of the reasons that Israel hasn't, has delayed the ground invasion is not because they're worried about the Riyadh season in Saudi Arabia or they're worried about Turkey or they're worried about UAE. It's because they're concerned Hezbollah might actually cross over from the, from the top. And they're worried that the Iranians' proxies will fire missiles. But I think that while Iran supports the Palestinians, and please forgive me, brothers, for, for this kind of rhetoric, I think that the ultimate aim, as Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis said, the Iraqi general who was killed alongside Qasem Soleimani by Donald Trump, when he was told by the Iranians, he was amongst some students, and they said to him, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, you are a mujahid, one day will be in, in, in Palestine, in Al-Quds. He goes, no, no, no. Riyadh, Mecca, Mecca, we will take Mecca. I think that Iran's overall aims and the way it goes about to achieve it makes it very difficult to celebrate its role. If the question is what has Iran done, Iran remains the only actor that is seriously threatening Israel that Israel is concerned about. Yes. Is this a good thing for the Palestinians? Yes. But I think that Iran's power comes from the Arab abandonment of their brothers and the Ummah's lack of action. We spread beyond the Arabs. The Ummah's lack of action in terms of supporting the Palestinians. I apologize for this answer. I know that this is a time for unity and the like. What I will say is, in many ways, it is a good thing that Iran is at least poised to pressure the Israelis and I think that has been a mercy on the Israelis in delaying the ground offensive. From a political analysis perspective, Iran in this regard is a major force and the Israelis are truly concerned about the Iranians. Whether that's a good thing for us, Allahu Akbar. Samuel Hamdi, Jazakum Allah Khair for your time. We really appreciate that. I think it's uh, worth saying that he is an important force of this community and we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to protect him, to preserve him, to increase him and to accept all our efforts. Jazakumullah khair for your time. And just before we finish, uh, and to build upon what Sami was saying in relation to what we can do, it really is important that we take these messages home with us. The narrative is shifting, so we must take the opportunity and build upon what we have already achieved by continuing to uh, spread awareness of the situation, continuing to make dua with our deepest, deepest sincerity, continue purifying ourselves and removing ourselves from sins, if not for our sake, for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Gaza and in the West Bank. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our brothers and sisters in Gaza. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them victory. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to destroy the plans of the enemies of Islam. Jazakum Allah khair for your time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Brothers, before you go, I just have one thing to say. There, 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 was a, there was a podcast where I used a misguided analogy. One thing that I, I will say is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers shirk to be the greatest crime, greatest sin. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Zumar to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu He says, In tell you, Muhammad, if you commit shirk, your actions will be, or your good deeds will be erased and you will be of the khasirin. Allah knows the Prophet sallallahu will never commit shirk. He knows. But he struck the example with the Prophet ﷺ and gave the scenario of him being amongst the Khasirin. But that does not disrespect or dishonor the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, nor did Allah dishonor him by making us repeat this verse. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, 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 Allah gives the example and he gives the scenario. If there were more than one God, if there was another God beside Allah, the heavens and the earth would be ruined. Allah gave the hypothetical that he considers the greatest sin of another Lord beside him and gave the scenario and gave the horrific scenario of Lafasadata. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wallahi law saraqat Fatima tu bin to Muhammad laqata'tu yadaha. If Fatima, my daughter, were to steal, I would have chopped her hands. His beloved daughter would never steal. And he would not chop her hands because she wouldn't steal. But he gave he used her as an example in the hypothetical to make the point. And the man went to the Prophet Muhammad and said to him, Ya Rasulullah, give me an exemption to commit zina. 
And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu responded to him with a hypothetical. Would you allow it for your mother? It makes him imagine. He says, no. Would you allow it for your sister? And he says, no. Here the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has not dishonored or disrespected the mother. Nor has he disrespected the sister. And therefore the analogy that I used was not intended to disrespect nor to dishonor the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For those who are unaware of what I'm talking about, I was asked the question. If, the, if that some people say that bin Salman's parties and raves are designed to combat the extremism of the Salafist thought. And I gave this a scenario in which if the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said the same and everybody cringed. And the reason they cringe because they know that it is outrageous, the suggestion for it in Islam. I appreciate that the analogy was misguided and that it could have been worded better. And I ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to forgive me for using it. And I ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to accept my tawbah. رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا إِنَّ سِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا رَبَّنَا وَلَا تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْنَا إِسْرًا كَمَا حَمَلْتَهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِنَا رَبَّنَا وَلَا تُحَمِّلْنَا مَا لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا بِهِ وَاحْفُ عَنَّا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا في الصنع القوم الكافرين اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا ونصنع القوم الكافرين And this dua is for me, please say Ameen اللهم إني ظلمت نفسي ظلم كثيرا ولا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت فاغفر لي مغفرة من عندك وارحمني إنك أنت الغفور الرحيم وصل اللهم على سيدنا محبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الكرام وصحبه الكرام وعلينا برحمتك يا عزيز يا غفار الحمد لله I just wanted to make that clear جزاكم الله ألف خير